started. Um, this we've meeting got a busy is agenda. Recorded. Okay. Whoops. Um, okay. And okay. So, um, seeing a presence of a quorum of the Community Resources Committee, and I will recognize Carol and Erica after I do the spiel for <laughs> the AMAHT one, uh, I'm calling the CRC meeting to order at of 7.02 p.m. This is a special meeting pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by chapters 22 and 107 of the Acts of 22, and extended by chapter two of the Acts of 2023. This meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the, uh, members of the public who wish to access this meeting may do so via Zoom or telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time. Um, we are also recording this, this meeting. Um, so right now I'm gonna call the role of the Community Resources Committee. Uh, this is a joint meeting with the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust, but I, I will call the role of the CRC to make sure they can hear and be heard. Um, we're starting with Shalini. I'm here, present. Uh, Pat. Present. Mandy is present. Pam Rooney. Here. And Jennifer Taub. Present. That is all five members of the Community Resources Committee. At this time, I'd like to recognize Carol and Erica to call the AMAHT meeting to order and take their roll call. Uh, go ahead, Erica. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we are here as the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust uh, as part of the joint meeting of the Community Resource Committee of the Town Council. Um, just to be in sync with the CRC committee, we will also do a roll call, which we generally don't do, but I do wanna recognize that today is a special meeting. It is May 18th, and we are now doing a call to order and a roll call at 7.04. So I'm going to go ahead and call out my co-chair. Carol, can you hear me? I can hear you when I'm here. Thank you. Ashley? I'm here. Grover? Here. Rob? Here. Risha? Here. We have, I believe we have six members. We are a quorum. And so uh, the call has been uh, completed and we may start. Excellent. Thank you. Um, by prior agreement of uh, the two co-chairs of the trust and myself have agreed that I will be moderating and presiding over this meeting. But anytime any of the co-chairs have any comments or any committee member of either committee have any questions, comments, please raise your hand. Um, I'm going to right now explain the uh, what we're going to do tonight. And then we're after I get through that, we're going to move to the presentation from Dave Zomack and Nate Malloy. Um, but the order is we're going to we're talking about affordable and attainable housing tonight. Um, and the we're going to hear a presentation from the staff, a short one so that we can get to conversation. And then we're going to talk. I, we worded it as housing gap priorities. So so what our two committees might think of a conversation around what priorities we're looking at for affordable and attainable housing based on the pre staff presentation and all of the data we have. Once we talk about that, we're going to move to public comment um, and we'll accept public comment at that time. And then when public comment is over, we're going to talk about the approaches we could use to address those priorities. Um, and then we'll move on to trying to figure out who should do what approach um, so that we've got a plan and then uh, future plans for how we would implement those approaches um, or collaboration between the two bodies. Again, we have some suggested time limits. We'll try to stick to that, but our goal is to end by nine. We don't expect to be able to complete the conversation in two hours. Um, are there any questions before I hand it over to Dave Zomack and Nate Malloy um, about the, the schedule, the plan? Um, if not, we're gonna go right into presentations. I see no questions. So Dave and Nate. Sure, let me, good evening, everybody. Um, Dave Zomack, Assistant Town Manager and uh, Nate Malloy, who's going to join us here um, is one of uh, our senior planner. Nate, we didn't talk about who's gonna, are you gonna share your screen or? Yeah, um, I, can, I can do that. Okay, we didn't do we didn't do a PowerPoint for this. We're really going to use the some of the resources that uh, we pulled together and basically do kind of a, a scroll through some of those resources. And Nate can kind of run the show here while I do a, a few introductory remarks, and then I'm going to turn it back over to him. 
but thanks um, you know for the CRC to the CRC and and the Housing Trust for pulling this together. Uh, Nate and I really see this, and and we hope you do too, as a conversation, not really a presentation. We 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 want to be part of this tonight as staff. Um, we we are deeply committed to uh, housing production in Amherst and affordable housing production specifically in Amherst, and uh, we're looking forward to this. With the two of us, I think see this as Mandy suggested as perhaps the first in you know, what might be a series of conversations about these topics that we're gonna cover. Two hours is really uh, a, a, great a great introduction, but it doesn't probably give us time to really dig deep into the weeds on, on some of the uh, potential uh, opportunities and outcomes uh, that we would like to see. Um, I did wanna give Nate a special thanks for pulling the, the resources that, he, uh, that, that are in the packet together. Um, um, that took a lot of time, and I think you'll find some of the data, if you haven't reviewed it, particularly some of the data on um, affordability and, and units and um, the SHI really helpful. Um, first off, I guess I want to, um, you know, um, recognize the complexity of the topic that we're going to talk about tonight. The market in Amherst and the market in the region is very complicated. I think we all need to acknowledge that. Um, you know, the university and the college uh, community that we live in, both here in Amherst and in the region, creates both some incredible opportunities and, and helps to make our town richer and the region richer. But um, all of those folks looking of all different ages, looking for um, um, housing, definitely uh, makes it a complex arena to do the work that we want to do. I also want to acknowledge that Amherst has and continues to be a leader in the state in the production of affordable housing. You know, this is a decades long effort. We're all coming into it at this particular moment in 2023, but many staff, many committees and boards, uh, millions of dollars in funding, uh, both at the local and state level have come together through the years to create the, uh, the housing that we do have. Um, and the town council, uh, the housing trust, uh, many committees and boards before us with different names, uh, going back to the to the many years of town meeting, all contributed to uh, putting you know good thinking into how do we keep Amherst affordable and how do we uh, move forward with production of affordable housing. I think we're all here tonight because we recognize there there is we're reaching a crisis point here in Amherst and in the region. Um, uh, costs to families and individuals have risen sharply over the last five years or so. And um, that's why we're all here is to try to look for some new approaches and creative solutions. Um, I just say, I will end by saying, you know, Amherst, I think our approach has been built on collaboration, commitment, creativity, hard work. And um, that's how we're gonna work our way through this and, and hopefully find some solutions is through that collaboration. And I look forward to working with you um, um, as we move through this. So. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, neither is Nate, on every one of these documents that we provided for you. I hope that you all had a chance to look at them. I believe they were posted last Friday. Is that right, um, Mandy? But yes. We will, you know, hopefully be coming back. Um, this first page is really about um, kind of setting the stage and giving everyone a solid base of understanding. Where are we? How have we gotten to the point we are? How did we produce the units that we produce? What kind of funding went into those units? What are some of the approaches that we've taken over the past four or five decades to, uh, to produce affordable housing? And um, what are some of the strategies uh, moving forward? I want to highlight the 2021 Comprehensive Housing Policy. That was the policy that was adopted by the council and the one that staff look at the most. I also wanted to link that in your minds to the master plan. Everything we do as staff in town in planning, conservation, inspections, zoning, um, et cetera, uh, is linked back to the master plan. So I think in your mind, having that framework of comprehensive housing plan and master plan, what are the linkages between those two? How do we look at zoning moving forward? How do we look creatively at uh, creating density in our village centers? Um, I'm not going to say a lot about uh, this slide or this this part of the the, the document. I, I do just want to call your attention to those 
to those five main goals of, of the plan. And as we look forward, um, how do we encourage um, all of us to, to spend time at some of the strategies uh, that we need to you know, embark on and embrace to produce more units um, and um, also look at our zoning uh, so that our zoning allows more units to be created where we want them uh, to be. Um, way at the bottom, Nate, if you could scroll down under implementation. I think that's where we're going to spend a lot of time tonight is what are some of the creative approaches, solutions, alternatives that we can look at. I think, you know, again, um, since our form of government changed uh, and, and the town council uh, came into being, there has been a lot of focus on zoning, regulatory and policy strategies, um, certainly, you know, looking at budgets moving forward, creative partnerships with those, um, those organizations in our community and in the region who create and build and fund uh, affordable housing and housing of all types. We're doing all of those things, um, but we're still struggling. We're still struggling as a community in our region to produce enough units to really take, take a, a big bite out of uh, the, 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 the challenges that we face. Um, next slide, please, Nate, or next. I'm gonna try to go really quickly here because I want Nate to have enough time to, to talk with you all about some of the data because I know there was a lot of questions about data. I'm not gonna spend any time on this. This is really just outlining some of the roles and, and uh, responsibilities, if you will, of the various organizations. I spoke about collaboration. Um, you know, we've got the CRC, uh, a subcommittee of the council working uh, very hard on zoning and, and uh, working on uh, rental bylaws and, and other things that can make change townwide. Uh, we have a great working relationship with the trust. We've done some very creative projects with them. And then we have a, you know, we have a robust staff. We have a creative staff and experienced staff, and we're out there trying to um, make a difference, um, look at properties creatively, look uh, creatively with our, our, our private developers at how they can produce more units. I often say one of my sayings in a lot of meetings is we need more housing units in all different categories. And I, I stand by that. We, we need to produce units in as many different categories as we possibly can. Uh, next, next slide, Nate. Um, again, I think this is a great area for, you know, spending a little time later is, is talking about, and Nate and I are happy to take questions on, you know, kind of what is the town doing? What has the town done to support the production of both, both market rate units and affordable units? Um, obviously, the trust has played a key role in that through the years, um, engaging the community, advocating for projects, advocating for funding. Um, as I said, the staff uh, in a number of different departments uh, works to promote affordable housing, works to promote housing in general uh, through our zoning, through planning initiatives, et cetera. And then we're out there, uh, if you keep scrolling, Nate, um, we have a very active role in the CPA process. Um, we, we fund affordable housing, if you keep scrolling, if you could, Nate, a little bit down on funding. We fund, as a community, we fund affordable housing projects using CPA dollars, using community development block grants, CDBG funding, and more recently, uh, when the town received ARPA funding, the town manager committed um, about $2 million uh, toward um, housing projects in general. And then there are, you know, the, the number of state grants that and federal grants that we go after and have been quite successful at, at getting through the years. And of course, there's always, uh, we're not, I'm not gonna go further into regulations and zoning, but again, I think the council has taken a very active role at looking at zoning and how can we be more creative and responsive to some of the housing challenges we face by changing our zoning um, uh, in the past couple of years. So I think I will stop at the next slide, Nate, if you wanna quickly scroll to that because I wanna leave Nate. The next couple of pages, I'm not gonna take a lot of time, but I think Nate did a wonderful job um, pulling together uh, some of the great examples of uh, projects that the town has been a part of. We have funded um, through all the, the sources I just mentioned, a number of really creative, um, really wonderful projects throughout town. 
um, from Olympia Oaks to uh, the units at the North Square. And right now we have, as many of you know, we have a number of uh, projects uh, in, in the pipeline. Uh, that would include Valley CDC's home ownership project up at the Medusco property on Ball Lane and Pulpit Hill Road. We're working very closely with Wayfinders on the 70 plus units of rental housing at East Street School and um, Belchertown Road. We just purchased the VFW site down Main Street um, and we'll be working on some conceptual designs for that property, looking at a shelter on the first floor and permanent supportive housing on the second and third floor. And then we've got other properties that we're looking around town, uh, including land off of east, um, uh, off of um, um, uh, down in South Amherst at the South Amherst School, as well as a couple of other properties. So the key is to get as many projects in the pipeline as possible, and that's what the town is trying to do. So let me turn it over to Nate and uh, uh, see where he's going to take us in terms of some of the data uh, that you all requested. Sure. Thanks, Dave. <clears throat> Yeah, so I mean, I think, you know, there's a more comprehensive list of what's been funded that was provided in the packet. So the town's been, you know, funding affordable housing projects for, for decades. Um, you know, it, it takes a lot per unit to help, help make things affordable. Uh, in terms of data, you know, there's been some question about the SHI. I think, you know, the year on housing units is what's, um, uh, it's from the census. And so we have, you know, 9621, 9,621 year round housing units, you know, uh, the SHI, right, is a metric used across all towns in the state. So we're at 13%. You know, everyone's been asking, well, what really is the number of affordable units in Amherst? And, you know, it's about 894. So, you know, slightly under 10%. And so there is this, you know, this delta, this difference. And, you know, so in some of the more recent developments, say North Square, you know, 20% of the units are affordable. You know, that means 80% are still market rate. And so the you know, it's just a, it's a number to me, it's not, um, 10% was never meant to be, um, satisfy the need of affordable housing. It was something that it was a goal to help spur production of affordable housing. And I think it's done that. So in Amherst, I mean, I don't think that we think, um, 10% is where we stop. Right. So some communities like to get there and say, well, we've, we've done our, we've done our due diligence and we don't need to try anymore, uh, for, for Amherst, you know, we, we haven't used it as, as that kind of, uh, measure. Um, you know, just in recent developments, I think is important. We support comprehensive permit projects. We also uh, in, um, changed our inclusionary zoning. And so with, you know, we've already um, provided 30 rental, new affordable rental units with inclusionary zoning. In the coming year, there's a few other projects where we'll probably have another, another 30 units. And so inclusionary zoning is working. Um, it's, you know, it's anywhere from one to two units in a project up to, you know, 10 or 11 or 12. Um, residential units permitted since 2015. I think this is really important. Um, you know, there's been over 800 units permitted uh, since 2015. You know, um, uh, you know, 77 single-family homes, a lot of multifamily units, and you know, the number of accessory dwelling units is growing. And so, you know, I, I, at one point, the town um, in the 2000s, you know, it may have been around 40 or 50 units a year, and sometimes it was even less. You know, and it was all single-family homes. Um, so for, you know, uh, late 90s, early 2000s for 15 years or so, I think the town probably would average about, you know, eight to 12 single family homes a year and maybe one or two multifamily units and not a lot of additional housing. And so it's really changed in the last few years. And that's, you know, I think that goes to show what zoning and certain incentives and regulations can do uh, to help get development um, in the village centers and downtown. Uh, income is really important. So, you know, what this is showing is for a four person household, uh, these numbers were just recently updated, though. Um, you know, 150% of AMI is 140,000, you know, 80% is 75, and it, and it decreases. Um, what's important, you know, it's unfortunate these aren't on the same slides, is that what's the cost for housing, right? So, if 30% of your income is devoted to housing, this is what it breaks down to. So, at 80% AMI, it's 1800 a month. Um, 50% is about 1,200. And, you know, the bullets that we will see down below is that the cost of home ownership or rental is beyond the means of almost every income level. So if we say the average home price in Amherst is 450,000 given current interest rates and 20% down, which is a lot, 
uh, you know, your monthly costs is $3,000, which is, you know, more than almost every income uh, limit here, except for the 150% AMI or greater. Uh, you know, from rental listings online, you know, it's anywhere from 1800 to 2000 a month, right? So that is um, above 80% AMI for most units. And what that also is, it's above what a voucher can, you know, a Section 8 voucher can afford. So it's above, you know, on average, every, any market rate unit in Amherst is more expensive than what um, a voucher can afford or what is considered affordable. And so really, there's a disparity between the market, what the market is producing, and then what we need to have be affordable at varying income levels. And so, you know, the market really isn't generating those range of income, you know, those units at per range of income levels. And I think that's the takeaway from, you know, this information. Uh, housing needs. So, you know, we've had various reports over the years. I don't think the needs have changed. I think the numbers may have, but in terms of, you know, we need housing for all income levels and all types and, you know, individuals, students, families, young professionals and seniors. So the housing production plan from 2013 estimated, you know, a few thousand units were needed at different income levels and different housing types. And, and really that, that, you know, this plan is dated. Um, detailed census information from 2020 still is not available yet. And that's what they use to generate this number plus some other um, sources. But Really, I mean, we're saying that, you know, for extremely low income, it's, um, it's a huge unmet need. For 50 to 80%, you know, it's a thousand or more units. And so, um, you know, that, that hasn't, you know, we've produced a lot of housing, but the need is still there. Uh, you know, the housing production plan really mentioned, you know, four priority needs, rental housing for families and individuals. And that's not, you know, the market right now is not producing those. Uh, preservation of existing affordable units. I will say we're actually pretty secure with our affordable units. In the last few years, we've worked pretty hard to, um, you know, with Rolling Green, we were, were able to secure um, an extension of affordable units. We've done that with Mill Valley. And so really, I think the affordable units we have now are, you know, are not expiring anytime soon. Um, and then housing for at-risk populations and special needs, the housing production plan noted, is something that really isn't, is lacking in Amherst. Uh, the, you know, the market study, you know, what they really said was that um, I think the, these, the, the two bullets in the middle is that, you know, we need 15 to 25 owner units per year and say up to 25 rental units a year. And that doesn't account for any growth in the university or colleges. And so that's, you know, that's about the 50, you know, 50 units a year. Um, and that's not, um, you know, again, at a range of income levels. I think what's really important is this age and dementia friendly project that's uh, happening now. You know, we had almost 900 uh, survey responses. Many of the, of the responses said they would want to age in place. And if half of our, of our units are owned, uh, home ownership units, and then most of the say, you know, 83% of those would like to stay in their homes for the next 10 years, then that's locking up a few thousand housing units that aren't going to be for sale for other, you know, for new families or young families. It may be an opportunity for certain programs, but if, if, if individuals would like to re remain in place, age in place, uh, and then there's very little housing for say right-sized housing for, for, for these individuals or families, they'll remain in place and that really doesn't allow, you know, changing, um, changing demographics. And so I think that's something a lot of communities are facing, especially in the Northeast, people would rather age in place. I think there's a lot of benefits to that, but we don't have a lot of options if they would like to move. So either they age in place or they leave town or they find very expensive assisted living facilities. And so, you know, what, what's really come out of this piece of the age and dementia friendly project is this is a segment of the population that um, needs to be looked at as well as, well as others. Um, Nate, you know, mass housing has a great- Nate, I, I hate to interrupt you, but could you conclude in the next couple of minutes? Sure. Thanks. Uh, data town, you know, it looks like they periodically update all this information with current census uh, estimates, which is great. And so, you know, these are pulled from there. You know, Amherst is, you know, the student market really does uh, impact Amherst. And so, you know, I think the second graphic is great is showing that home ownership has a much higher income level than renters, which is spread out over different income levels. And so that's not, that's not all students right, that impact that uh, renter household income, but it's really important to note because, you know, renters are um, susceptible to 
the, the imbalance in demand in the market. Uh, cost burden is something that's important, spending a lot of your income for housing. And as you can see, um, a lot of the renters in Amherst are cost burdened or severely cost burdened, you know, spending over half of their income toward housing. Uh, there's also a pretty good percentage of homeowners who also spend a lot of their income towards housing. And so that's something, you know, it's hard to, to manipulate the market as a municipality, but, you know, if just basic supply and demand is one thing, we, we have the ability to help incentivize supply. Um, you know, and this, this impacts enrollment at the schools. If you look here, it's dropped by almost a third, right? Uh, it goes back to uh, the highs in 2000s. And in 20 years, we've lost a third of our school age population. And so that, that's a trend that looks like it's gonna continue. Um, just quickly on student housing, you know, I like this recent Gazette article, you know, 900 students won't be able to live on campus and, you know, 13,500 beds were filled in four days. And so there's demand for students to live, they'd like to live on or near campus. You know, I think the preference would be live on campus or very close to it. And so I think that's something to discuss, um, you know, where can students live? Uh, the Donahue Institute, I think, is great for the region. This is, I'll wrap this up. You know, I think Amherst can do its part, but it's also a regional issue, right? If we, we could produce 10,000 units or beds, and they could all be full, but that's not, you know, more people might want to live in Amherst. So I love this second bullet. There's a housing income mismatch, right? There's, there's plenty of opportunity in the Pioneer Valley of communities where people would want to live, work and live. Uh, and so I think this needs to, there needs to be a regional approach, right? People would rather live where they work, where they go to school, but if they can't, they're going to be driving 45 minutes one way. Uh, and so Amherst can't solve this problem, right? They're saying there's over 17,000 rental units needed at a very low income or moderate income level. And Amherst can't produce 17,000 units. They, they can't be in our town, but as a region, we can start trying to um, help that equation. And, uh, you know, and homeowner, um, the last bullet really is, Home ownership is expensive. And so, you know, I think the traditional single family home is a model that may not be sustainable moving forward or even now. And so the question is, what, what, does, what does housing types look like to be able to, you know, retain and help, you know, the different types of populations we'd want to see in Amherst or in the region? And so, um, you know, I think the Donahue Institute is, is, you know, has really pointed to this mismatch both in who lives where and who's paying too much for housing. And it's, you know, it's often people of color, renters that are really cost burdened and subject to the whims of the market. And so, um, you know, I think we can have, I think that we can lead, that can lead off our discussion in terms of what are some creative solutions or what do we see as priorities and how can we address those? Thank you, Nate, for that presentation. We're gonna move on into, um, the, those priorities that Nate was was sort of talking about, given um, some of the gaps he just highlighted and what what you in your reading has have figured out, what are um, the priorities that people of our two committees have? Um, we're going to open it up. It might be given how many people we have, better to raise your hand either using the button or you're just <laughs> wave wave your hand, um, and I'll try to recognize people so that we're not talking over each other. Um, Okay, so would anyone like to start? It looks like Ashley would. Ashley. So it, it went a little quick, but there is in that presentation, there was a part that said, basically, there is no market rate housing that people at 80% AMI, which is 70,000, give or take. Is that true? I mean, maybe we could go back to that part, or if you just understand the data, but basically, it looked like nothing market rate was affordable for someone who's who had 80% AMA or less. Is that how you see that one bullet point? Right, right. So the average housing price in Amherst is right higher than someone at 80% AMI could afford of. Yes. Okay. And so there's 895 units for every person that makes less than 85 AMI or even wants to move to Amherst that makes less than that in Amherst. There's eight, 895 chances to have affordable rent if you make less than say $70,000. $70, 
which is 80% AMI. Is that about $70,000? Right, yeah, for a family of four, it was 75,000. But what if you're just one person? If you're one person, do you need that 75,000? No, a, a one, so that was for a four person household. So a one person, you know, would be, would be less, but I think that the numbers are the same, right? It's a graduated scale. So, you know, the rents don't, the rent, it would actually be worse, right? So a one person might be 47,000 and the rents are still the average of, you know, 2000 a month. Okay. So like a single person, let's say needs 47,000 or more to afford anything market rate and a, a family needs approximately 70 something thousand to afford anything market rate i i think i actually want to correct ashley because oh. <laughs> because sure. you're getting at something something good which is for a family of four 80 percent ami is about seventy thousand, and okay. there is no market rate housing for that that only costs 30% of that number. So if you're a family of one, that 70,000 is actually closer to 150% AMI to get oh. to that that number. Is am I interpreting those those rents correctly, Nate? Right. Yes. Okay. I just, you know, it's a good point to remember this is why people are leaving Amherst. They can't afford it anything at market rate. There's 895 chances and a lot of those units are full. So I don't see any other hands, so I'll I'll make a comment. Oh, Jennifer. I can't we can't. You're hear muted, you. Jennifer. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, I'll just jump right in here, I guess. So you would say but since 2015, um, there has been 862 new units in Amherst. Is there any way of knowing, so a, one question, is there any way of knowing, you know, kind of how many of that are being, were built for students and are occupied by students? So I guess just to cut to the chase, I mean, how do we, since, I mean, a realtor told my neighbor the other day, just came right out and said, not a realtor, I'm sorry, a developer, the business of Amherst is student housing. So if housing is going to be built to rent at the highest price, how do we ensure that some of the housing is built for that's not being divided among people that are, you know, just paying for a bedroom? Because if you're, you know, if I rent um, an apartment for my family, I would have to pay for all the bedrooms, not just one. So, you know, that's when when it's divided among roommates that are, you know, have separate budgets. I, so I guess just how how do we get beyond that? I just don't see how the, the building is not always going to be primarily for that market. Mandy, I don't know if, do you want us to comment as we go or do you want to just put out questions? No, you, you can comment, Dave and Nate, and answer questions like that with ideas. And again, some of these things, you know, this is, part of this was to generate questions, generate discussion, generate ideas, creative ideas. I know we have some folks in the audience as well, and I'm sure there'll be time for public comment later, but um, yeah. So Jennifer, I don't know if we have all that data we certainly could extrapolate by project what we believe. We don't know to a bedroom how many of those 800 plus units are rented to students. That's just not a data set that we have. I mean, we, you know, we we have a general understanding, but I, you know, you know, North Square is a good example. Some of the buildings even downtown. You know, have a mix of students and young professionals. They, they were so, built for that market. I, I'm not even clear. I'm just saying that they, that's the dilemma that we're in. Is I know you know in the um, what was it comprehensive housing policy? It said you know what we're discussing now. We need to encourage housing to be built at different price points, but it's that is really challenging because the private market is going to build to rent at the highest price they can get. And that kind of excludes yeah, so, everybody. I think, yeah, there, there, 
Let me just finish, Nate. They're, yes, you're absolutely, you're right. For the most part, yes, right, you're right. They're also going to build and design for that, for that kind of development. Um, there was something else you said there. Um, um, there was one other question you asked within that. Oh, so so one of the one of the mechanisms, one of the tools in in any municipality's tool belt is you know trying to work creatively with those developers like Valley CDC, Wayfinders, you know, Home City, et cetera. And the way that's traditionally been done is to work with them to design units, either rental or in the case of, um, you know, Valley's new project up in North Amherst, you know, home ownership. What, because of the high cost of, of, of building of raw materials right now and labor, um, and land in Amherst, that takes a tremendous amount of subsidy. So that's the way you get some of those new units down. And that's where CPA, uh, C, uh, CDBG, uh, CPA, and state dollars, tax credits come into play. And of course, for North Square, we ended up doing a, a, a tax increment financing plan with Beacon Communities over 10 years. So those are some of the tools we have, but that's one of the ways to get units produced that are that can go toward people who are not you know not necessarily students if you will so Nate you were going to add something yeah I was going to say that you know when we updated the inclusionary zoning and increased the percentage there was a concern that it would actually you know maybe stall development and so it's almost like you want to keep testing it so if, if we're seeing that full percent at larger developments isn't do we increase the percentage of affordable units to you know a higher percentage um, you know, I mean, I think there's so there's some incentives and maybe some regulatory things that could work. I get it, you know, so we can see zoning and regulations don't typically um, determine the interior layout of a unit. So if someone's designing a unit so that there's uh, four equal size bedrooms and not a lot of common space, you know, we don't typically regulate that to say, oh, you should design it with a living room and a dining room or something where you could have you know more common you know gathering space. I think that that can come about by working with developers and you know but it's really hard to regulate how say the internal layout of a unit could be configured in terms of then how it's rented. And so you know I think there's probably some other ways to look at it. I do think inclusionary zoning and incentives can help but um yeah so you know if we're seeing you you know we, some developers will say they don't like to to develop that way and others might and I think that's, you know, maybe just having that conversation um, more publicly can help in terms of how we'd want to see that kind of interior layout. And may, maybe, you know, we, we actually push the boundaries a little bit in terms of how the zoning board or planning board reviews things to see if we can get at that. If, you know, if we say we can't rent by the bedroom, does that mean we can actually see floor plan layouts and really scrutinize that more? I mean, I, you know, I, th I think those are things that uh, we, you know, we'd have to check maybe with legal counsel, but, you know, those are the things we could start looking at. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take a, a, a chance here and say, you know, one of the things that struck me in the presentation and in reading is is that aging in place or or that the survey that that talked about 80 percent of of um, those people would like to age in place and how that um, sort of puts the housing market in a stasis without that turnover that we sometimes expect that helps bring families in. And so in terms of the needs and gaps, I wonder if that should be one of our priorities, because it's my understanding that at least for housing of 55 plus communities, you can actually restrict who can go into them in a way you can't with a typical development. And so that might be a way to create the aging in place housing we would like if we can identify builders and locations while also then once it's built potentially opening up that that other housing to um other types of families to to move into carol um i could be completely wrong uh but it seems to me that when we're subsidizing the developments it's what is what we have to do in order to make them be affordable, as Dave just explained. And so that's the place where we are, expect to get the most inclusionary zoning gets us some. I was impressed actually by how much it seems to have gotten. That's really great. 
but any of but the other kinds of stuff that we do in order to get the subsidy, are there not sometimes restrictions that can be attached to that? I thought I had recalled someplace where you weren't supposed to be a full-time student, for instance. And since most of those projects have to go through, uh, come in by some kind of 40B process, have to go through a lot of planning looking at them, it seems like there is maybe an opportunity to ask the people to, we put out an RFR or whatever it's called for the project that's now going into East Street and Belcher Town Road. And we said a lot of things about what we wanted to see in the developer who was successful in getting the bid. And they were things like, we want a mix of bedroom sizes. We want to this to be advertised in all kinds of places for all kinds of markets. So at least it seems, I mean, what the, what the private market does is probably kind of what Jennifer is describing. But I think that the stuff that has subsidy in it, we have some more say over what is going on and who's gonna live there. Thank you, Shalini. Yeah, I'm just thinking of uh, the different strategies that, uh, that we need to employ and we have employed. So one definitely seems that you are hiring a person who's gonna be dedicated to reaching out to uh, developers who do build affordable housing. And I think that's a great idea. The other one that did not pass last time because the location wasn't right was a 40 R district. Is that something we can think about maybe in a village center or somewhere else that seems more appropriate? Um, but that seems to me like an important strategy. And the other thing I was thinking is also having certain areas like the gateway project, which would open up space for the college students and so that they are there in, you know, they are they have a space. So it's like this multi-pronged strategy that we are, that we utilize. That keep those thoughts, Shalini, as we move on after public comment into those strategies. Um, but I'm gonna probe you with a question. Of the gaps that we've seen and have been discussed, which would be the one you'd want to focus on most? And then we can talk about the strategies. Do you, do you happen to have one you're thinking about might be the most effective or or one you'd like to see the town focus on or one of the committees focus on? Mm, I'm going to think about that. Do All right. Excellent. Yeah. Does anyone else want to answer that question? <laughs> Ashley and then Pam. You know, the, the Donahue school, school, particularly their data, you know, this is Western Mass, but it says it's 17,000 units that are needed that cost less than $500. And I'd of those 895 units of, of affordable housing we have, do any of them cost under $500? Like just straight out, not section eight, because that's like a federal program. That I don't, I can't imagine we have a lot of influence on, but how many of those units cost the person less than $500 to rent? Do we know? Uh, we we don't typically know we don't typically know and I'm probably guessing not many. I'm no. guessing zero because I mean I can if we could talk to people, and if they have a Section Eight voucher, they do pay less than five hundred dollars sometimes, because that's depending on their income. But I have not seen any that cost less than five hundred dollars, and that's like a huge need. If I could add, Ashley, Nate and I talked about that that piece of the Donahue Institute uh, study earlier, and we need to follow up with that because we were both a little baffled, not by their data or their conclusion, but I'm curious what other regional providers of uh, you know both municipalities and and um, um, organizations that build affordable housing. What does that mean? I mean, five hundred dollars a month. Just, I, I don't. I, I. We understand where it came from from an affordability standpoint, but it just. We, we were kind of scratching our heads, saying, when, when was five hundred dollars a monthly rent in the region? You know, I mean, how many years back does that go? And and are we trying to reset a clock that, you know, and and a and a cost that may not be feasible. I, I just don't know. I mean, you know, we're getting into economics here of, you know, if we could snap our fingers and create 
17,000 new units of housing in the region would, I guess to your question, would any of them be at $500 a month? And I, I, That's I'm a having decision, trouble getting right? my head around how that would even happen in the market we're in, in this, in, in Hampshire County. But isn't that a decision people make when they make the rent? Like my rent is $857 and I live in North Square. So the people are making the decision how much they're going to cost each person on their affordability units. I mean, we can ask them to make different decisions or kind of require it. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's uh, we're think gonna it's, we're gonna have a series of you know um, we have another housing discussion tomorrow and I think I'm I'm curious to talk to the wayfinders and the Valley CDCs of the world and and see you know kind of how they took that Donahue Institute number and and where where they're going with it um, you know I just on affordability uh, you know as we look at um, the project up in North Amherst and we look at you know, the current cost of building, you know, a 1,200, 1,300 square foot home ownership unit off of Pulpit Hill Road. And, and we see numbers for the cost of those units in the fives. And then how do we bring those numbers down, you know, between a hundred and two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to make them affordable as home ownership? That's a very significant subsidy. So, you know, likewise on the rental side, how do we how do we do that? What are the mechanisms? What are the funding sources? But I, I think you're right. I think that's what brings it down in an affordable level for people in the region. Well, isn't one thing to build much more affordable housing? Like, the, that green that East Gables one was a very good example, and also Olympia Oaks. Those units are thirty two thousand each, and something like forty one thousand each. If we build lots of units that are very cheap, more people live there, and then also their rent and their mortgage can be much less, as opposed to building the very expensive units that very few people can have, like two or four, and then you know you're getting half off. Like the unit is five hundred thousand dollars, and you're selling it for two hundred and fifty, you're getting fifty percent off. When there's like a, I don't know the economics exactly, but if there's a $32,000 unit, aren't you, it's just a lot easier to have very low rent. So I just want to jump in quickly. Those numbers are what the town contributed per unit. It's not what the unit cost was. So, you know, I think North Square, the unit cost was, you know, $350,000 to build each unit. You know, so it's, you know, so I think the, the, there's definitely some, additional costs when you do a, a tax credit project, you know, there's definitely some redundancy. I think, you know, a lot of people across the state would say affordable housing is expensive to build just because of the types of programs it's developed into, right? It's, it's you know, a developer, a private developer can build probably cheaper than most affordable housing developers, right? On a per square foot basis. You could have someone build a 2000 square foot house at $250 a square foot right now, but to have Valley CDC build it, it's going to be five hundred dollars a square foot, because the, the the programs there's you know there's just so much that it takes to actually do an affordable affordable housing in this state. And so I think you know people have been talking about this for a while that we need to change the kind of the whole system of how we develop affordable housing. But those that those that that those I just want to make sure that the numbers we saw on the spreadsheet and or on the summary and what was in the form. The ta- it's, a, it's the town contribution to affordable housing. So at Olympia Oaks, it was average of 41,700 per unit is what the town gave. So the town gave, you know, almost $2 million to that project. It didn't, that's not the cost per unit of construction. The cost per unit of construction was something else, but that's what the town contributed. And so, um, you know, so just quickly at Ball Lane, Valley is going to be building at $550,000 a unit they're trying to get 200 to $300,000 subsidy per unit so they can sell them at $200,000. So they're still gonna be made whole by you know, using ARPA funding, CPA funding, block grant money for first time home buyer programs, using the housing uh, commonal builder program. And so you know, their cost is still 500, whatever it is, say 500,000 unit. They're gonna then 
figure out how can they sell them for 200 and how are they going to fill that gap of 300? It's not that they're building them for cheaper. It's that they're getting subsidy dollars to get them down to a sale price that's affordable at those income levels. And so, you know, it's, that's the system, how it works. It's not like they're, someone's building them for half the price of everyone else. They're just finding subsidy dollars. Oh, excellent. Okay. Hold your thoughts, Ashley. Oh, Dave. I know you want to go to other folks. I just want to put on our list for later. Ashley made a good point. I mean, numbers, density, we've got to, you know, that's, that's where we're going to get more, you know, cost per unit goes down. We get more units. We get more, you know, diverse units, if you will, one, two bedrooms, et cetera, et cetera. But that's, that's got to be the name of the game, you know, density in our village centers. And I'll stop there. I know there are other hands. Yep. Thank you. Pam. Thank you. Um, just a quick comment on Dave's. Uh, interestingly, though, that we have the five-story buildings in the downtown and the outcome was, I don't know, 130 something units like for one, one East Pleasant. And it's pretty clear that they are not charging rents that are commensurate with density and, and being able to build multiple units at once. Those are, again, some of the highest priced units in town. So there may be a profit, a profit factor that, that, you know, gets taken into account. So someone asked if there were particular priorities. Um, and I think every study that we were provided, every study that I've read has the two ends of the spectrum. We have the, we have the pressure from student housing, which, you know, I talk about all the time. Um, but it is in fact a factor that was identified in each and every one of the studies that we were given to read. It, it skews the market in this town. If the university can be pressured uh, to encouraged somewhat to either build additional housing on campus or procure housing from some other source, such as Hampshire College, to borrow and rent and look at uh, opportunities like that, that is, that may take off at least some of the pressure from increasing enrollment. The other end of the spectrum, as we just heard, is, you know, us old folks who would prefer to stay in our houses, but who, if we, if we had an alternative, which was an attainably or reasonably priced place to move into, um, then, you know, if, if I had that option, I could perhaps then sell my house and maybe this house could become a duplex. I don't know. Um, it, it, but I, but I'm not going to move out and, and unless I want to leave Amherst or I have somewhere that's, that's reasonably priced to move into. So I think in my mind, if we're trying to deal with those two big population chunks, getting, getting me out of my house frees up something for a younger, a younger set of folks. Thanks. Thank you, Pam. Risha. Uh, and thank you. And just to be clear, we have a different time to talk about potential solutions. Yes. Um, so I guess to answer the, the question on, I, I do feel like there's probably a, a um, I don't know the phrase for it, but you know, a double win in addressing the senior housing, uh, as people have said, that if if we can create something that works for seniors, whether that is new senior housing, affordable senior housing, or something where there's uh, incentives or less penalty for more house shares and, and co-housing for seniors, um, at, and the accessibility dwellings, um, that opens up more housing for others. But I do feel like there's a bunch of questions we haven't, I don't see in any of these, you know, bylaw strategies or policy strategies, um, issues around taxation. I have questions around apartments. Um, I know that they were stopped being allowed and what, what where that is and what the conversations have been. Um, and then, yeah, just really, how do we incentivize or penalize, as it were, the the kinds of housing that we want? Um, how, you know, beyond subsidies, right? Like, how, like if you're building affordable, you don't have to have parking. 
right? That's a, we've cut a cost. We've, we've given that incentive kind of thing. So I, I, it's hard to talk, not solutions. Sorry. I understand that. <laughs> um, thank you. Shalini. Yeah, I was just looking for a clarification. I think Nate, you touched on it about the town's contribution. But in terms of when we say, for instance, uh, the town contribution for the Mill District North Square was $2.8 million, but that's tax incentive over 10 years versus $1.75 million. So is the difference that we're not receiving tax versus the other one being the town is actually paying money for the units? Like, what's the difference? Yeah, no, that is the difference. So you know, North Square has been the only development that took advantage of the local tax incentive. And so it's foregone tax revenue that the town won't receive over a 10 year period. You know, and it can it can be, you know, there's a write down period, but right. So for North Square, that's the total over 10 years of tax dollars that, you know, um, that essentially is given to them so that they could help, you know, uh, make that development for most almost I think every other one that's on that sheet and that we we highlight that's those are actual dollars that the town provided either for construction costs for acquisition for pre-development costs you know engineering architecture and so for olympia oaks over the course of many years you know we the town paid for all the road work and infrastructure we paid you know 1.2 million with block grant money we paid three hundred thousand dollars to study the property to see if it could be developed we gave money for construction you know half a million dollars in for construction and so that those are actual dollars spent on that unit, you know, whether through block grant, um, CPA, you know, Community Preservation Act funding or some other funding, grant funding. And so most other projects, it's actual dollars put in. Yep. So also then per unit, when we say 107,000 per unit, again, that's in tax incentive or was that? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So it's taken. Yeah. So it's over the 26 units. It's, you know, that take the, the total value of what it will be. It was $107,000 per unit of contribution you know it'll be end up being over a 10-year period but mm -hmm. that's what the town right yeah but i think that's important for us to also understand because one we're actually physically paying cash and one is it's coming out of future earnings so just mm -hmm. thank you um carol i just want to note the time we're going to go a little over um but after probably the four people that still have their hand rates we'll move to public comment carol uh, um, oh yeah, okay. I well, you asked about gaps, and it seems to me that there's there are gaps everywhere, but one of the ones that I feel less able to understand how to get at is the gap of sort of workforce housing. People who are like making more than you, you probably can't get subsidy to do something for them, but they aren't going to be able to be served by general development because it's probably not going to happen to include them. So that's a gap that I, there's gaps everywhere, but that's just one that I, I don't see how to get at. And the one other thing I wanted to say was I was, I was kind of interested to read in the 2015 mark, housing marketing study where it noted that Amherst has part of its problem going back historically, or at least coming in 2015 is Amherst has bigger lot sizes. Amherst has fewer options for making things dense. Amherst has these things that make it harder for somebody to build something here and they are still here. And that's kind of zoning issues. And I know the council and especially Mandy and Pat are working there, are working a lot on that stuff, but I just think it's it's worth noting that it actually is that we are different than surrounding towns in the way that we have done that. And in the fact that our lots are as big as they are, uh, I pass, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, yes, a couple of things. Well, first I totally agree with you, Carol, that the big, you know, one of our major gaps is workforce housing. And I think if, you know, we could increase that, I think we would also see maybe we could you know, reverse some of the trend of our declining K through 12 enrollment if we could, you know, also have families and, you know, sort of get more of that, what did we say, 25 to 50 year old demographic moving into Amherst that would be sending kids to our school. 
but um, and it sometimes talked about that well you know we don't we want students to live close by so they don't have to commute but we it would be terrific if UMass the university employs a lot of people if they could live in Amherst and not have to be you know commuting long distances um, but I did want to I guess maybe echoing what Pam said is that you know I density um, in Amherst it doesn't seem to have really opened up housing you know um, I Pam and I both, you know, our constituents where we live and the people we represent, we live in the residential districts that have the smallest lot sizes already zoned for, you know, all kind, you know, every multi, you know, category of multifamily housing. And we have seen that the housing that's built is for the student market because that's the highest return on investment. So, um, and the other thing that we have seen, and it's, we've seen it all over town is when we, you know, talk about people of retirement age, maybe moving out of their houses if they had other options in Amherst so that the houses could turn over to, you know, um, members of the workforce is that because, you know, we, we also have the pressures of the student housing market in that market as well of these houses, particularly, you know, maybe that are more at the average um, being purchased by investors, and then we lose single family houses and they are converted to student, you know, rentals because they, there's such a great return on investment there too. So we, we sort of have that pressure coming in many different places. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Um, before we move to public comment, I want to just summarize some of the potential, um, gaps that I heard people saying they might want to prioritize. Um, basically, it's most of the gaps I heard, but I'm trying to put them into some categories, which we'll come back after a public comment for. And if I missed any categories, you know, we can we can add them as we talk strategies after public comment. I heard senior housing, the workforce housing gap, um, the less than 80% AMI units, um, that gap, so so everything up from essentially zero AMI into the workforce side, which is 120, 130 AMI, um, and then student housing pressures in town. So those were sort of the four categories I heard. We'll come back to that. We're gonna move to public comment right now. Um, we're going to accept public comment on anything within the jurisdiction of either CRC, or the housing trust. Obviously, we would love it if you focused on what our conversation tonight is, but um, you can provide us any public comment you want as long as it's in the, within the jurisdiction of one of the two committees. And you'll have up to three minutes to um, make your public comment. Um, and we might take a little leeway with that depending on how many public comments we get. Um, so um, if you would like to make public comment now, please raise your hand and I will recognize you in turn. Uh, we have one right now. So Dorothy, uh, oh, Nate, are you going to let handle that or do you want me to? Nate's handling it. Dorothy, please unmute yourself, um, state your name, where you live and make your comment. Uh, Dorothy Pam, 229 Amity Street, Amherst. Um, I share the concern for uh, family and workforce housing, uh, but I do not agree that that will happen by densifying the downtown residential neighborhoods for the reasons that Jennifer has so well stated, which is they will all end up going to high rent students renting by the bedroom. And then we'll be destroying our family housing. But I share your goal and I think that we can do it, but we have to think differently. Um, many of you have heard me talk about Sunnyside Gardens in Queens, which was a one, two and three family attached brick house community uh, that was actually many blocks. And it had interior greens, little front yard, little backyard, and then a green so that people had green space, um, but it was dense, okay? And people were allowed, it was affordable in that if you had a two family house, your tenant rent would pay your mortgage. Um, and that's how we got in. We came in as renters and ended up being able to buy something and then selling that when we left the area. How can we do it? We cannot do it with market forces. We have to have donated land. And there is a piece of land that might be very suited for housing that was turned down for the DPW. Um, we need donated land from some of the, the college or the university. I think it's probably the college. Um, Sunnyside Gardens was not done with market force. You know, it wasn't because the market force is going for high rent. Okay. It was done with a purpose, which was to provide 
housing for individuals and families. Because when you have one, two, and three family houses, you have rental units, you have home ownership units, and you have people have a chance to uh, earn their equity um, or to move up as, as they have more children or get more money, whichever it is. So I, I would be very excited to work on that with anyone. But I don't think that the idea that density, particularly near the college, is going to result in anything except totally uh, breaking a really great residential neighborhood, which already has a sprinkling of students uh, incorporated in it in ways that, that mostly work out quite well. Um, so I would love to work on this with somebody because I think this is the way we're gonna do it. And I agree, we actually have to build uh, a wider variety of housing and it's, it can't be done with market forces because the market is really bad. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy, for your comment. Um, next up is John Hornick. Um, please, when you get the chance, please unmute yourself, state your name, where you live, and make your comment. And welcome, John. Uh, thank you, Mandy. Uh, I am John Hornick. I am a resident of Amherst, 59 Carriage Lane, at least for the foreseeable future. Um, I, there is generally a concern with new development and it's being taken over by students. I think the one area where that would not happen is new development of senior housing, because senior housing, typically when it's financed, uh, when it receives federal funds, is age restricted to persons over the age of 60 or 62 or whatever, depending upon the source of financing. So I think that can be an important part of the planning, and it should be, as folks may know. I particularly think that we should be looking at the buildable land on West Pomeroy Lane, uh, where the uh, next to the, the newest development is for uh, conservation. I think there's room there, and I think that housing for seniors would be the least disruptive to that area. It's also close to a village center. And so I think that should be on the priority list. Thank you, John, for your comments. We have no other hands up at this time. Um, so we're going to move on away from general public comment. We'll see how the discussion goes. I may or may not take more comment after we talk about the approaches, um, but we're gonna move on to approaches for reducing housing priorities. So we talked about what our gap priorities might be. Um, I just summarized them, so I'll summarize them again. There could be more, obviously, but senior housing, workforce housing, less than sort of the 80% AMI unit, um, AMI, cost housing and addressing the student housing pressure. Um, and so we're opening up to thoughts on, pick one of them. I'm not gonna make us go through each one. You can pick whichever one you have thoughts on and address. I'll make the notes myself, as well as George who's taking our minutes on um, where that that strategy potentially fits into our priorities. So um, floor is open for talking about strategies we might be able to use to address any of these priorities. Shalini. Oh, Ashley had a hand up too. Do you want to go? Oh, well, it's, it's, you can go first, Shalini. Sorry, I missed you, Ashley. That's okay. Um, so, you know, I'm very interested in workforce housing and family housing, like in making it an uh, inviting place for families to move in and stay and live. My one, um, um, the thought always is that when we are thinking of a solution to first find out from families, what is it they would want? Like when people are living in Leverett or moving to uh, other areas, what is it that would they would want for them to move back? Because we can make a unit affordable, but if it doesn't have a little yard or if it doesn't have, let's say something X, Y, Z, then you know, it can be affordable, but they may not move back. And I've heard that from some teachers who prefer to live in other areas because the value they're getting in Leverett for, um, you know, and and so maybe that's one of the things 
we may need to think about is actually doing a survey of some sort that gets to understand what the different, whether it's seniors, what are they looking for, or it's uh, families, what are they looking for in a home that would make it attractive for them to move back or move to Amherst. Thank you, Shalini. Ashley. You know, I am no economist, mm -hmm. so it's really hard for me to understand these numbers, but for instance, there was, it might've been a home ownership place that cost $500,000 the unit costs five hundred thousand dollars to make, but when they sell it, it's going to cost this the the owner about two hundred thousand dollars with three hundred thousand dollars of subsidies. Was there something like that? Okay, so just your basic idea: three hundred thousand dollars is three tiny houses. So we're getting one five hundred thousand dollar, I'm sure, very nice house for. $300,000 $300, in subsidies, we could be housing three more families. And so it's just like putting a fine tooth comb onto the economics. If we want to house people, we might need to house people at a very cheaper rate. It costs less for them, certainly, but it's not like it's not the town borrowing $300,000 to ha house one person or one family that then also pays $200,000. Does that make sense? Why are we spending so much? Dave's nodding his head. Does he wish to? No, I have other comments to make, but but uh, Ashley, you know, raises good questions. I mean, these are these are things we need to grapple with. That is a that is a lot of money, and it's a large subsidy for one unit. And I think. You know, it's it's um, it's a it's a really good thing to grapple with. Even you know, as Nate and I work with Valley and and work with Wayfinders, and I you know I want to give them those two agencies tremendous credit because they are true partners here in Amherst and in the region. And every time I go to Northampton, I you know look around and notice a new development that one of them has worked on and. My wife is kind of tired of me saying, "Hey, look at that! Oh my goodness, there's so many units!" and da 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 da. But um, they're very creative. But yeah, um, they're faced with the challenges, as Nate alluded to earlier, of rising costs and and raw materials and and everything, all the legal costs that go into it. And before you know it, we're climbing into the fours and into the fives. And where does it go from there? I can't imagine what units cost in Boston or Worcester, you know, per per unit. So it's a challenge. I think. We need to but we at. know, we just know from a presentation that in Dover, New Hampshire, if you work your magic, they cost about one hundred and eighteen thousand dollars per two-bedroom tiny unit. I mean, this is a lot of finagling, and the best developer who is not taking a cut. But we know we can do it a hundred and you know twenty thousand per unit if we had to. I wasn't at that presentation. I I know there was a lot of discussion afterward. I, I I do think land is a challenge. A finite amount of land in Amherst is a real challenge, given the land that the university, Hampshire College, and and uh, you, um, and Amherst College all own. Again, uh, somebody earlier alluded to: uh, Could there be opportunities for the the colleges in UMass to donate land to allow something like that to happen? Um, so I, I think we need to look at that because land for a number of, of tiny houses and then the appropriate zoning, we, we certainly should, should look at that. Thank you. Erica. Thank you. Um, I was struck by the 2015 market study because I thought it was pretty comprehensive and it actually laid out what some of the what the problems were and then some very specific recommendations. And it also broke it up between focusing on some of the student issues and the campus issues that included uh, working with Amherst College and getting some donated land because they seem to have a lot of land. But it also then looked at uh, how to protect non-student renters as well. So I think there are a lot of strategies there, some that are already being implemented, such as unlocking multifamily development, which um, Mandy Jo, you've really been um, putting that along with Pat, um, you know, multifamily units by right, um, considering university neighborhood overlay district. So to 
push the university in doing some of that, uh, enabling uh, infill development with existing apartment complexes, and then for the non-student renters, housing incentives overlay, expediting review processes, and then you know the units per acre having more housing uh, per acre versus what we have right now, and then small homes. So these are all things that we talked about, and then it has a whole section on regulatory changes that could support all of that. So I think we have some strategies um, that are pretty specific within that study that, that might be useful for us. Thank you, Erica. Shalini. Wait, didn't Pat have her hand before me? Pat, did you wanna go? Yeah, I was simply gonna say that uh, while I really support the idea of tiny homes, um, and I'd love to see it where we wanted to put the DPW uh, um, a while ago, Dave and, and Nate, a small family, a small a tiny home is not necessarily going to house a family. So while I really support that as a solution for single people or, or couples, and I believe in building smaller, you know, I think that that is not the solution, but just one for families and for workforce housing. And, um, mm. Thank you, Pat. Okay. Shalini. I can go. Um, I just had a process question for a sake. You know, we're putting out all these different ideas. Are, are we make, is someone making a note in what's going to happen with it? After we get the ideas, our next topic of conversation is how are we going to implement them and doling them out to various people? <laughs> so then going back to what I think Carol, someone brought, or Erica brought up that we have a whole list of sol potential solutions in our comprehensive housing policy we had come up discussed it and then also in the the production plan so that those are good places to look at and then the other thing that was brought up today and i just want to reiterate it now because we're talking about solutions is um the size of the house lots that is a huge issue and i think we should put that as something we need to talk about in crc and also the 40R and the Gateway Project. Thank you, Shalini. Dave. Sure, I had a couple of, I guess, questions or, or things to put out there. Um, they're all related, obviously, to housing, but a little bit different. Uh, excuse me, been talking all day. Um, I wanted to just circle back to something Shalini said a couple of minutes ago is, is really, really, we probably need to do a little bit more work on what do people want? What do young families want? What do single individuals want? What, what do people want uh, when they look at, you know, we, I think we, we, we hope we understand what makes Amherst attractive to come here and work here and live here and study here and all the things they want, they want to do that make, make us a wonderful community. But, but I don't think we've done a lot of work with you know, really understanding, you know, what, what young families, what are all the barriers? Clearly cost is, is, a, is a huge barrier, but what do people want? I hear a lot that people want smaller units. They, they don't, they, for lack of a better term, you know, the American dream of that one acre or half acre with a big yard and privacy and this and that in a cul-de-sac or whatever may not be what a lot of people want anymore. Many people want more freedom. They don't want to take care of a, a, a yard and, and the house burden and whatever. So but do they want condos where they can still uh, uh, achieve equity goals in their lives as families or individuals or, or, or couples, whatever? Um, so I think Shalini made a good point there about finding more, you know, more data in that, in that, front, in that regard. Um, a couple of other things. Um, you know, I just wanted to, to, to put a point on, you know, five years ago, I don't think, and I know, I don't want to focus too much on market rate housing. I heard everyone earlier, yes, a lot of the market rate housing that has been created has been geared towards students, but not all of it. We don't have all that data. I wish we did. It's very hard. We don't know how many non-students are living in the North Square development. We don't know how many non-students are living in the 
the new units downtown. We know some are young professionals and graduate students, et cetera. But, but I also wanted to remind everybody that inclusionary zoning has captured more units than I think any of us thought you know, would happen. And Nate alluded to this earlier, maybe we need to look at that a little bit more rigorously and see if there's ways to tweak the inclusionary zoning bylaw to capture more units. But again, five, seven years ago, I mean, if you look at, you know, um, May, lower Main Street housing, uh, we have new housing going on on Southeast Street. We have U Drive South. We have Aspen Square. We have the Spring Street development coming on, on online shortly. So there's definitely more, more, more housing in, in, you know, all over town. I do also want to acknowledge that, you know, when we talk about proximity to UMass, we know that graduate students and undergraduate students generally want to live as close to campus as, as possible. So what's happened is, and this is one of the complexities, complexities of the market is, even though more units geared towards students have been created, again, we don't have all the data on this, but I think there's a strong indication that we are pulling students from other towns who simply want to be closer to campus for the convenience, the amenities, et cetera. And I think Sunderland, Nate and I, and, and my staff talk a lot about what we believe is kind of the pulling sound from Sunderland. Again, not picking on that community. It's a wonderful community. But other than the flats, which is a relatively new student, student geared uh, uh, development off of Route 116, many of the units farther out, I think Cliffside has done a lot to keep their development uh, updated and well-maintained, but some of the other ones farther north, I think are less attractive to UMass students than they once were in the 80s and 90s. So I think as more building has happened here, students, if they can afford it, they're choosing to live closer to Amherst. I did want to just go back to kind of density again. I want to go back and just put a point on our master plan calls for densifying village centers. And so as I think of that, and we talk about it with staff, um, you know, the East Village, the lower part of College Street is, is a wonderful opportunity to densify, you know, uh, already developed land from really from, uh, you know, from the underpass East, you know, potentially all the way to um, the transfer station you know, on the way to Belchertown. That is, you know, and, and all of us probably travel that way many times, you know, a week or a month, and you kind of look around and go, wow, there's already some housing down there. We know that Colonial Village is interested in, in some opportunities there with their land. We know that Mr. McChi, who is doing the uh, development on Southeast Street, is interested in more units there. So again, um, the gateway, somebody, maybe Chalonet or somebody else mentioned the gateway a minute ago. I think we need to come back to the gateway. I think we need to look at Triangle Street. What could happen on Triangle Street? The Xana block, you know, we all love the Xana block, but it's a one story cinder block building from the 1950s or 1960s. We have to look at that seriously and, and say, is that really an opportunity that we're gonna pass on? Uh, obviously it's private property, but could we get the develop the owners to look at something creative by going up there and creating more units. So um, again, I know it's, uh, you know, we need to be more creative around getting affordable units uh, in all categories, but I'm just saying there are opportunities for redevelopment. Um, they are happening all around us and, and developers we have in our community are taking advantage. Lower Main Street, Spring Street, uh, Southeast Street, uh, uh, you drive south, um, where we captured uh, how many affordable units in the you drive south uh, development, Nate? I think there was uh, four or five. Four or five in that development. But again, almost no opposition. Nobody came out, as far as I know, in opposition to, re to uh, redeveloping that old vacant lot on the corner of Snell Street and Route 9. Um, but there you have it. We got affordable units and we got market rate units. So anyway, just putting another plug in for dense densification. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to mention a couple things. I think the smaller, you know, if we're hearing a lot about people want smaller houses, um, 
we either have to look at the multifamily housing or if we're looking at some single family housing for smaller houses, we need smaller lots for those smaller houses because most people aren't going to buy a half acre lot or a three quarter acre lot um, or an acre lot and then build a small house on it. Um, that's just doesn't tend to happen just because of the cost it costs to buy that size lot. So if we want smaller houses, I think we need to look at the smaller lots that go with those houses for the single family home type houses. For the others, um, if we're doing multifamily, maybe not. Um, I think I read somewhere about maybe senior overlay districts. You know, we've done a lot of overlay districts, but finding places in town where we might where people might want senior housing um, or that we think is logical for senior housing. And instead of relying on the zoning we have, maybe create overlay districts for that, that, that could be potentially denser um, because of all of those restrictions that come with it maybe and what seniors want or don't want if we once we do I think the the survey and finding out is fantastic idea um I think you know and and I don't know how much the trust has leeway with this but but the East Street Belcher Town Road RFP I know had a certain number of subsidized housings at certain different AMIs and then had the ability for market rate housing. And I know the plan is to bring some market rate housing is in. I wonder if we should be looking at also when we put those a minimum of X number of 80 AMI and X number of 50 AMI, putting in a 100 or a 120 AMI to catch that that number. I think the trust might even be able to, depending on where it gets its money, um, which we're working on, um, be able to go up to that 100 or 120 AMI if it's not potentially CPA money. And so we have to find you money somewhere other than CPA. Um, but if we can start finding that money from other places, maybe we can start requiring, instead of going from 80 AMI to, and then market rate, those those middle numbers in there. Um, and then another one I thought of was for potentially overlay, but other rezoning is our PRP land. And um, as Dave was talking, the comm land in East Amherst, that comm land can't have any housing on it um, at all. It has a lot of single story buildings that would probably be perfect for redevelopment into mixed use buildings, not solely housing, but specifically mixed use buildings. So either looking at rezoning we're adding um, the ability at, for a special permit or a site plan review in the comm for a mixed use building of some sort um, might open and unlock some of that. And then in the PRP, there's also not housing allowed. And I know where I live, there's some PRP land that just is vacant that could probably take housing um, either through mixed use or high density PERD or something. And so I think those are some creative things we might be able to look at. Um, Nate raised his hand. Carol's I, like honor. <laughs> and then to that, I just, I just, could you explain COM and PRP? Oh, COM is our commercial zone. Um, so you. it's a, it's the zone. It's most, you know, there's a, there's a strip of it on College Street in East Amherst, and then there's some in other places of town. But that East Amherst strip can't have any housing on it. Um, and that I know the planning board has been looking at that. And when they looked at that, they're like, hmm, if we want to develop East Amherst, maybe we don't want that comp. <laughs> maybe we want it a different district. Um, so that's what commercial is. PRP is short for professional research park. And it also doesn't allow um, housing. Professional research park is some of it is where um, the the Cooley Dickinson urgent care and on you drive some of that is. PRP land. Um, I don't know where else PRP is. I know there's some in the adjacent to Amherst Woods where the Atkinson building and all is. Some of that is PRP. Um, and it was intended for uh, what it sounds like, professional research. Um, so so research offices, um, potential spinoffs from the universities that aren't high industrial type spinoffs, um, but it hasn't really done what it was originally intended for. So we've now got land sitting there that can't create housing. Um, so Carol got that, Nate, and then <laughs> Jennifer. Sure, thanks, yeah. I mean, I was just, I was gonna say that the planning board has been discussing East Amherst Village as an area for rezoning or looking at other village centers, Pomeroy Village Center in terms of, you know, there's a lot of zoning districts. And I think, you know, the, the proposal by Pat and Mandy in terms of duplexes and triplexes, some of the difficulty is our zoning districts are so intertwined that if you apply things district wide, 
it may not have the impact you want it in certain areas, right? So right near a village center, we might have residential zoning where maybe it should be village center zoning. And so I think the planning board, for me, the conversation is, okay, do we actually have to then look at how do we change zoning districts or is it overlay districts? And I think that, you know, uh, Manny, to your point, I would rather see a 40R over East Amherst and get affordable units um, than maybe, you know, say something that doesn't encourage affordable units. I think, um, you know, Rolling Green, we used to use as a great example because it had a mix. It had 20, 25% affordable. There were uh, families, there were seniors, there was individuals, there were, you know, a range of different household types and um, it was all rental and it was a great balance. And so, you know, I don't know if it's that we need more. I think we need, whether it's through incentives or regulations to, if we have denser developments so that it's not all students and then just a small percentage affordable, we need to have some other tools to help balance those developments. I think if we have a hundred unit development down in East Amherst and it has inclusionary zoning, 12% are gonna be affordable and the rest are gonna be really high market rate units, unless somehow we have other regulations or incentives to change that. And so the trust could do that. I do think it gets expensive per unit to subsidize things, but I think, yeah, maybe we have to think about what, what are some other tools that communities are using or other places are using to try to get that mix of household types because the market in Amherst is really strong, um, you know, and so what's being built really isn't, uh, you know, someone isn't gonna uh, develop a unit and then charge half of what they could necessarily. And so I, I think I like what the planning board, I like this discussion. I like the idea of where can we change, how can we change zoning or regulations, incentives? I still think we need to think about how do we make sure that there's um, a balance of unit types for different income levels. And so ideally that would happen through market forces, but I don't think it will in Amherst or say the surrounding region just because of the housing, housing market. And so it maybe could in Greenfield and maybe could in Brattleboro, right? Vermont, but in Amherst where it's, we have a, you know, I think a really unique market that's even different than 20 minutes from Amherst. And so I think we have to have then strategies that are really specific to Amherst. Thank you, Nate. Jennifer. Yeah, uh, I want to say a few things. Um, okay, first, in terms of like the, you know, I think there, it's often said, oh, well, in some of the new building, like there's a lot of buildings that um, Archipelago has built. Those are the buildings downtown. Well, they're not all students. They are almost all students. I live three blocks from the two downtown buildings. And when UMass, when school, UMass is on vacation, those buildings are, are almost completely dark. And the, the tenants that live there park along Kendrick Park on the west side, it's bumper to bumper. When school is in session, there are no cars there when UMass is on vacation. So students are living there, I would say with the exception of the um, inclusionary zoning affordable units, and, and maybe there's one, I don't know, very few. And, you, and again, we see it all the time because most of those buildings are dark when school's not in session. And again, there's no, literally no cars parked at Kendrick, um, on the west side of Kendrick Park, you know, over Christmas vacation. Um, and I don't, you know, I think we also, you know, have that people moved to Amherst because they did want a little green space. I don't know, you know, there has been a lot of, there are definitely um, many people that live in town that probably wouldn't be happy to see another five story building where Xana's is, you know, with no setbacks, but that's another conversation. But I would just, you know, and in terms of, I, we really have to talk, think about, you know, do we think that all the students at UMass who have to live off campus need to live in Amherst? That will make Amherst a very dense place to live. And I'm not sure that we were, you know, looking to move, you know, to live in Amherst, you know, to not have some green space. And it does feel like, I think, you know, for like the village centers and the area that, you know, uh, Nate talked about where we, you know, could, there are many places we could do densification, but I sometimes hear it talked about that, let's densify our densest areas and then leave our most open areas the way, keep, keep the zoning the way it is. So I think some of what, you know, again, I live where I live, it's small houses on small lots for the most part, but people that live in places where there's large houses on large lots, you know, do, are, do you and your neighbors, are you willing, you know, I hope you are, 
to divide up those lots. But I, I always feel like that it's looking at, you know, the in-town districts to become denser. So the outlying districts don't have to change. So, and that might also be another conversation. So I'll leave it with that. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. She, Jennifer also brings up a good point about, um, I, I would the the camp the off campus student housing um, or housing students off campus and where where whose whose responsibility it is um, and it can't just be Amherst's Hadley has part of the campus on it and we need other municipal partners that also border the campus um, unfortunately they're not always partners <laughs> is what I would say um, but the regional solutions are also just as important as the local solution is, I guess, one thing I would say to, to summarize some of Jennifer's comments. Ashley. You know, I was just thinking like, if we could take a look around and we don't have to like do a head count, but who among us is like under 40 years old? And I'm 46, so um, I'm not sure, like, well, certainly I don't think in this room, but I'm not sure that we're talking to people even under 40 and what they want. And I feel like it's pretty disconnected. Like when I talk to 25 year olds, 26 year olds, 27 year olds, like I don't get the feeling they want a big house with a lot of dishes and like five kids. It's just that, you know, we talk a lot about what seniors want but it makes sense because we're in this particular room also, we're half seniors. These, these planning things tend to be 50% seniors and 0% people under 40. And so representation is a big deal. I just don't get the feeling that we're studying people under 40, talking to people who are clearly 25, 26, 27, up to 49, who are, I'm 46, so I'm just saying anecdotally, if I wanna buy, it's definitely not in Amherst. There's places to go if you're 25 to 49, and it is not Amherst. So there's a lot of seniors that live in Amherst and also that population is exploding in terms of it's getting bigger. The, the population from 25 to 49 is getting less and they have no representation in, the, in these rooms or maybe one person. I just think that we need to start thinking about the people that are fleeing and we never talk to, especially officially, and the, the seniors that we are 50% of the conversation almost always. That's a great point, Ashley. Erica. Um, <clears throat> so I just want to say that um, I do talk to people uh, in downtown Amherst, especially those who work here. Um, there have been a couple of people, especially young people who service Amherst, um, who wanted to live here and who actually over the year and a half been looking for buying in Amherst um, and um, literally talking to them about trying to get them into Amherst to looking at, you know, what kind of subsidies they could get, um, you know, in terms of um, state subsidies to just do a down payment, et cetera. Um, and the individual that I was hoping to actually get maybe onto the trust who is very young, I would say probably uh, maybe late twenties uh, and has just uh, had a child, um, they ended up buying in South Hadley because that's where it was affordable. Um, the other uh, people who work here, they're commuting at least 40 minutes to work here. So there are a lot of young people who do want to rent here and who do um, want to be here uh, because they work here. This is where their job is. This is you know, where they've invested in this community and they see it as a vibrant community. Um, and so I think you know, it goes back to that affordability. Um, I think Amherst is an attractive place to be. And I think there are young people who would like to stay here and be here. And there are also a lot of college students who have made a decision to stay here. Um, so I, I think, you know, they, we have a listening session on June 20th. We need to get those flyers out to a lot of different people uh, around. But I think those who work here, like, um, you know, teachers and firefighters and um, people who work in our community health centers, uh, I think it's really important to listen to them, as you say, Ashley, but I think a lot of them do uh, because they've invested here in terms of their work, would like to stay, would like to live here, would like to have their their, um, their children go to school here. Uh, and that's also a lot of uh, UMass 
um, people who work in the dining commons, who work in physical plant. Um, my husband worked there for years and he, he's been talking to a lot of young people about um, staying here and just not, it's just not affordable. They'd like to invest here because they've spent a lot of time um, in this community and like to stay in this community. I, I Thank agree, you, Erica. I agree, but then they buy in South Hadley and then they buy in Holyoke and then they buy in Chicopee. So it's like, it, it would, it's great to want something, but it's not possible. And I don't think they think it's possible. And then it's not, then they don't do it. Yeah. Jennifer, and then we're going to try and move on to implementation. Right. I was just, I do agree, Ashley, that of other people said it's a great point about having that younger or middle demographic in the conversation. I know when CRC did our Engage Amherst survey, um, we noted that the smallest response category, I think was that kind of 30s and 40s. So if it would be, you know, um, you know, for your listening session, it would be great if we could somehow bring in that demographic, because that's where we seem to be most challenged to get their input. Thanks. Thank you. So we've heard a lot of, oh, Shalini. Just in terms of input, if y'all are reaching out and having a listening session, what really worked for us was reaching out to Tony Maroulis and uh, what's her name? Nancy Buffon. And so they sent out an email to students so that you can get young voices in terms of if they want to graduate and stay, live back in Amherst, what would make it attractive for them? So that's one way. We're going to move on to who might implement or work on or investigate some of the strategies we talked about. I think I have like 15 bullet points, so I'm not sure we're going to get through all of them, but I, I'm going to put Dave and Nate on the spot. I'm trusting some of them were taking some good notes too, but um, of the strategies and all you've heard tonight, Nate's laughing here. Um, which ones do you think would be most appropriate for the staff to be focused on instead of say the trust, the planning board or CRC? And I know we don't have the planning board here, so it's kind of a cop out to say the planning board should do stuff, but um, you know, what what are your thoughts on on some of the splits based on some of the strategies you've heard in terms of investigating or or looking at more or doing with? Nate, do you want me to start or do you want to start? Oh yeah, so I was just I was just writing something down. Yeah, I mean I, I like the idea of like, you know, a multi-prong or a multi-step approach. I don't I think that um, you know, a few things can happen at once. And so I do like the idea of whether we call it student housing or gateway or some type of overlay there. Um, you know, the planning board has been talking about village centers and then, then they sometimes say, well, okay, let's also talk about students. But I think we, I think there really needs to be, you know, a conversation about that. Um, and, it, and it's also, I think, I think it's right. You know, what's the capacity, the carrying capacity of Amherst in terms of units and residents, right? I mean, we, um, and so it, and whether it's zoning, it could also be, you know, conversations with UMass. It could be, you know, what are other ways to address the, the student demands in terms of what kind of pressure they put on for housing. And so, you know, I think, I think the planning board is appropriate to look at some zoning and they've kind of, they've been discussing it. And I think we could, you know, if that's something we think is a, a good priority, we could, you know, we could give them that direction, right? Say, okay, here, there's these, these ideas. Let's have you continue that discussion. Um, I think it's also staff. I mean, the, the housing trust had Tony Maroulis, Nancy and uh, Betsy Greco from UMass recently. And there had been conversations before COVID with UMass and we were hoping to have kind of a you know more conversation open up, um, kind of in the absence of UTAC. But you know whether it's the trust or staff, I think having those conversations is really important to understand. You know what are the kind of the the motives of UMass? What are their um, intentions in the next few years? And kind of how do they see you know their housing and their student populations? And so um, you know it could be a few, but I like the idea of addressing the the student piece. And I think that there's probably a few different you know, I wrote right staff, trust, CRC, planning board, you know, so there's a few, I feel like there's probably three of those four could be actively involved in that. Um, Let me jump in if I could, Mandy, real quick. Um, 
Yeah, completely agree with Nate. Um, and maybe, you know, again, I, I don't know as we're going to finish everything tonight and maybe there's a continued conversation here, but, um, you know, I do, I do think we need to be realistic about, you know, how much staff can do. What, I do think it's very important to identify what are the staff roles in some of these. Um, we, you know, and, and priorities of staff generally flow this way. The, the, the town council gives the town manager, uh, uh, gives Paul Bachman goals every year, and then those flow down to staff. And, you know, we have some, you know, uh, flexibility and authority and, and um, you know, to use our, you know, creative uh, approaches and, and go after funding. And, and sometimes we, uh, you know, we get lucky and, and other times we don't. But I, I do think we need to be realistic and really prioritize what those are. Um, I know the council is going to be talking about, you know, kind of what some of their goals are for the town manager next year. But I, I do think we need to be realistic because we don't have you know, three staff positions just to work on housing. So where does affordable housing and where does the housing crisis fit into the goals of the council? How much of a priority is it? Um, you know, honestly, in the last two or three years, um, you know, certainly the, the council finished the uh, comprehensive housing policy. We're working on that, not to say we aren't, but the two identified priorities for last year kind of flowing into this fiscal year were diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, you know, getting the CREST program going, and then sustainability. So that's a lot of staff time right in, in those buckets. How, how big of, an, uh, of a priority is this for the council? And therefore, what will flow from that are the town manager's, you know, um, uh, uh, you know uh, goals for the staff. Uh, I, I'm going to say that we're not going to stop on all the projects we're working on. We're going to work with Wayfinders. We're going to work with Valley CDC. And those are in those are intense processes to get 70 units built here and 40 units built there and work on the, the VFW project and some of the other land that's been mentioned tonight. So, um, and it's interesting, we haven't talked much about funding tonight at all. And I just want to put a little plug in. We're not even going to get to that, but all of these things take money. So local money, state money, federal money. So we need to tuck that away for next time to talk about how do we get more money to do some of the things we want to do. So. Thank you, Dave. Shalini. I just want to touch on one thing, which I think is interconnected to so many different pieces. And that is, uh, you know, talking about money, one way we raise money for affordable housing is by increasing up tax base through some of those buildings that we're building. So that's why when we say that we, you know, like we can't obviously absorb all the students who are at UMass, but finding certain areas where it makes sense for students to be when they're closer to UMass is an advantage to us when it's on private property because we're getting taxes and then that money can be diverted towards more affordable housing units. So I just wanted to highlight that. And the other thing is, if we don't build housing areas for students, it's not like they, some of them will go to different towns, but sometimes or many times they are buying over homes that our neighbors are selling because and get converted into student housing. So it's not like if we don't build for uh, students, the problem is going to go away. We're just not going to build and let them go to Sunderland. Some of them will, but some of them will continue to live and buy over some of our homes. So we do have to think of them as part of the community and work in where do we build housing for students and where do we build for seniors and where do we build for families just think holistically. Ashley. You know, I would, I mean, I would kind of like to work on like really kind of sussing out, does Amherst want to make the investment in having people that are 25 years old to 49 years old live here? 
like long term and that is also the workforce like people who are 25 to 49 years old tend to have jobs and they might already be in Amherst the job could already be in Amherst but when those people live here and and they work here they're paying income tax and they're paying sales tax it's like that is the workforce that is making the like they're making the most money and so wouldn't that bring in money if more people 25 to 49 year old year, year olds lived here in an affordable way but they're still buying a lot of stuff they're still like you know their income tax is like coming into town the town eventually it just seems like there would be an advantage of keeping 25 to 49 year olds in amherst just for like the town thriving and making money and expanding and having kids you know like to go to that new school that's going to be great but there's less kids every year so does the town want 25 to 49 year olds in it? Like, let's think about that. Thank you, Ashley. Um, in listening to the conversation and I'm, I'm trying to figure out ways we can sort of go away from here with our own sort of lanes as it were. So we're not overlapping necessarily on some of the work. Um, and so I'm just gonna throw a couple things out here as I was listening to the conversations, what I, kind of heard or looking at the strategies we talked about what might fit where um for staff concentrating on obviously the zoning parts um, as well as everything else they're already doing but managing some of the potential zoning issues um, and some of that would fall to discussions with the planning board in particular um particularly with, um, I think Nate was saying, village centers overlays. I added in there senior housing overlays, 40R overlays, you name it. We, we talked about a lot of different sort of possible strategies. Gateway was in there. Um, uh, for the CRC, some of the things I thought might fit best with us um, are discussing how we could fit into the manager goals um, some of the priorities that we've talked about and some of the strategies we've talked about tonight to be able to potentially make a recommendation as we get towards um, setting manager goals in the fall, something coming from CRC on housing um, and zoning and all, um, potentially handling the surveying and outreach of what we talked about of um, what housing people want. You know, we handled some of that surveying before um, with the rental permitting. Maybe we could think about trying to do that outreach and taking that on as a committee. Um, and then what Ashley just said in terms of, you know, th that goes to that outreach. Um, what do certain demographics, certain age ranges, certain types, you know, Ashley was talking about the 29 to 49 year olds. Um, what would they want? And then once we figure that out, it, Ashley said, you know, what would the investment Amherst need to be? What would have to be done if, and are we then willing to do that? Um, and for the trust, I know as little, you know, I don't know as much about what you guys do as, as I do CRC. So um, I, I was writing down things like you've already started the conversations with UMass. Um, so continuing those conversations about housing potentially with things like, um, how would UMass like to do stuff with not just student housing or what that works, but their workforce affordable housing developments, you know, particularly like how, how, how do they see bringing their employees back into living closer to town? Um, uh, what is the best use of subsidies for housing, particularly the AMAHT funds you get? What, what would you, you know, Ashley talked about how much money, um, we put to subsidizing housing and all. And I know that's been something that I think John, when he four years ago presented a draft policy from the trust on housing to the council, you know, are there targets we want to go with? Do we want to um, focus it in one area over other areas? I think that's a perfect conversation for the trust to be continuing. Um, and then Potentially, I think you've already had these conversations, but that surplus property um, and town properties, what would be the best uses of some of them based on some of the priorities we've talked about tonight? So those are some of the things I came up with. I'd love to hear people's thoughts on that sort of lane 
trying to find lanes um, before we move on to what our next steps are. Uh, Carol. Um, I was looking at the page of the document that we got that has kind of, I don't know what page this is or even which document, but it has roles, community resources, Amherst affordable housing, town staff, and uh, I've never even seen anything like this before that even tried to say what the generalized roles were. Maybe that's just because I haven't looked in the right place. I don't know. But that seemed like a, a kind of a useful framework, maybe, for not different, I don't think, exactly from what you're saying, Mandy, but maybe a framework that would be useful. And the other thing that I don't know where this fits into who's doing what, but one thing I would really love it is if as we try to track these things, there could be one place that we can all look at the same thing. It feels like there's there are there were like four or five plans that we were supposed to look at. All of them had goals and not really any of them had, here's how we have progressed against the goals, which is understandable because there's so much going on, but it would be helpful to me if somehow there was a, a a consolidation of this stuff so that we don't have to look at, this is the way the trust is looking at it. This is the way CRC is looking at it. This is the way the staff is like, there's $2 million of ARPA money for housing and the trust sent in at some point, a whole lot of possibilities for what to do with it. And kind of here's back things piecemeal every once in a while when it happens to come out. So knowing, having a better communication and a better system so that we all know what's going on, as well as who's doing what, is something that I would very much like to see. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Any other thoughts? Uh, Shalini, Carol, I assume you just have left your hand up. So there was this uh, New Hampshire Workforce Housing Bill or a law rather that was passed in New Hampshire in 2010. And so they, like we have affordable housing um, laws at the state level, they had it for New Hampshire's workforce housing law that was meant to promote workforce housing. So I don't know if that's something that we can maybe send to um, state rep Mindy Dom and push for something like that at the state level where we get subsidies for workforce housing or other strategies for workforce housing. And I'm happy to send, there's like a document that looked at what how effective and benef that law was over 10 years. So I can send that to Mandy Joe, to you, to everyone. Um, sure, to, to, why don't you start with me, Carol and Erica. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have Carol and Erica's email, Nate or Dave, and we can push it out to all the committee's yes. members. Um, Ashley, then Jennifer, and then we need to move on. Yeah, I was just thinking that it the, the population that I'm most interested in is the 25 to 49, and that is um, graduating college kids. I assume there's like a thousand or more graduates every year or maybe like 2000, I don't know. But anyway, they have very shiny new degrees and they probably have a lot of enthusiasm. And what if they could be compelled to stay in Amherst and help us have an interesting town? And also, and all the way up to 49. So that's that's a large amount of people that like are not finding that living in Amherst after you know graduating from college is kind of like their thing. I think we need to do a little bit of study about why that is, but then also the representation of people under 40, like being almost nil, like maybe we could recruit some people that are under 40 and maybe the affordable housing trust specifically could have a quota of younger people. I mean, I don't know how old Grover is, but maybe she's the youngest, I, I have no idea. But the point is, is that we need to be talking to the people that are leaving because like, if we don't, we don't know why and we don't know how to fix it. And yep. so could we recruit some new people like to give Thank us you. some perspectives next time on like what it's like being under 40 and trying to like afford something here. Yeah, recruiting for board and committee services quite hard and an ongoing and I know 
our committees work hard for the ones we appoint and uh, Paul's got people, community pre uh, participation officers and all working on it, but it's a great point. Shalini, your hand is still up. Okay. So we were supposed to talk about collaboration and future plans for collaboration. I think we've kind of covered some of that. Um, we've kind of got, an, and we'll try to send out some some summaries, but we've kind of got some ideas of what we can each do to continue this conversation on our own. Um, I I personally foresee months before we get together again as a group um, so that we'd have something to report in the next conversation or something to really talk about. Um, but other thoughts on, you know, sort of future collaborations and, and, and that sort of um, topic. Pam. Yeah, I was going to ask if uh, the presentation that Nate and Dave read through, um, I hadn't seen it before. Uh, it looks like there's some really good structure in there that could, um, you know, they were talking about the zoning, they were talking about um, categories of work that's being done. And that was, that was um, a pretty nice way of organizing some of the material. I would appreciate having that sent out to us all as well. It is in the packet. Um, I didn't see it. I thought I had sent a, in, maybe I lost track. I know I sent it for the packet. I know I put it in the packet. I okay. might have forgot to tell people I did that in, in a loss of so things. You, so I apologize. You shouldn't um, have to tell us that but, there's something in the packet. I uh, Clearly yeah. I missed it. So yeah. I will go back and find it. Thank you. Um, so any other thoughts? If not, um, let me look at the formal agenda. Do we have any announcements from anyone or anything not anticipated by either chair in the last 48 hours? If not, I want to thank everyone. I want to thank Nate and Dave, well, Nate especially, but Dave too, um, for doing all the work to put all that information together. I know that was a huge task, a huge a huge thing to do, but um, I think everyone here found it extremely helpful um, to just be able to see it all in one spot as, as um, one of us was just saying, a, a place where we get it all. Um, so thank you for all the work you two did um, to help us have this conversation. Thank you to the trust um, for uh, suggesting it. Um, I think Ashley's the one that sort of started us on this. Thank you right. for suggesting it and all. Thank you for CRC members for coming on a Thursday night and adding a meeting. I know the trust added a meeting too, but this was your sort of normal meeting time, at least on Thursday evenings. Um, and I want to thank George in the audience who is taking the minutes for both committees um, for, for coming and taking those minutes and adding that meeting in too. I hope I didn't forget any thank yous. Um, well, so but... The thank you that you forgot was to thank yourself <laughs> for making the agenda, chairing a meeting, herding us cats successfully. Uh, a cat comment. <clears throat> a cat comment. Ashley, your kittens are beautiful. <laughs> I do. I just got kittens. <laughs> <laughs> With that, I kept you almost on time. So, um, Carol and Erica, you guys need to adjourn your meeting, and then once you've adjourned yours, I'll adjourn ours. Okay. We are now adjourning our Amherst Municipal Affordable House Trust meeting. It is 9.04 and we are officially adjourned. And CRC is also adjourned at 9.04 <laughs> p.m. Thank you all. And thank you for chairing. Thanks. Yes, yeah. thank you very much, Mandy. Good night, everybody.